Good afternoon. I'm so glad that you're with me today. Um, this is going to be a very unusual study. And the reason so is that after I posted uh, Genesis chapter one, first teaching of the Genesis series that I did last week, I had some of you um, send me questions. So what I want to do is before I venture any more into Genesis chapter one, what I would like to do is um, talk about or answer some of the questions that you have sent. So one of the questions was about dinosaurs. And I was going to just go ahead and give a brief um, answer to this. And then I thought, no, I'm not. I'm not going to give a brief answer to what about the dinosaurs? So after, um, so like I said, after the first teaching, I want to uh, address some of these questions and some of the questions that we, that were sent to me, I will be addressing in future lessons. Uh, what I would like to say is that if I have not thoroughly uh, addressed any of your questions thoroughly, and you still have questions, please do email me and I'll try to answer them more thoroughly. I never thought <clears throat> in a million years that I would ever be teaching a Bible lesson on dinosaurs, but here we go. I am teaching this lesson because I feel this lesson is important to our creation series in the book of Genesis. People have a lot of questions about dinosaurs. A lot of what I researched uh, concerning dinosaurs, I have studied in various sites, one of the sites being Answers in Genesis. And of course, we need to go to the Word of God. So here are some questions that we're going to answer today. Do we see dinosaurs in the Bible? When did God create dinosaurs? Did dinosaurs and man exist together? Well, the answer to that is yes, they did. And God did create the dinosaurs. We do see dinosaurs in the Bible, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. And that may be shocking to some of you that dinosaurs lived, man and dinosaurs lived together. And uh, But don't be shocked because it's in the word of God and it's very plain. Everyone is interested in dinosaurs. Humanity, young and old, are fascinated with these creatures. There's no question as to whether or not these creatures really did exist. We know that they existed, and we know that they roamed the earth. And we know this as a fact. How do we know it as a fact? From the many worldwide archaeological digs where dinosaur bones have been uncovered. So we know Without a doubt, dinosaurs aren't just a myth or a legend. But the big controversy is, is when did they roam this earth? Currently, the secular dinosaur timelines begin around 220 million years ago. And then the dinosaurs go extinct around 60 to 65 million years ago. Evolutionists claim dinosaurs evolved over millions upon millions of years. They started out as amphibians, and then they, they evolved into reptiles. And then those reptiles evolved into dinosaurs. But the question here is, is that even true? Well, if it were true, then evidence of these amphibians transitioning into reptiles, and then you'd have reptiles transitioning into dinosaurs, and those fossils would have been found in abundance. But secular archaeologists who really are honest will admit not one questionable transitional form between any group of creatures and another have ever been found. The dinosaur bones that have been found when tested are 100% dinosaur. They are not 
part of a species that is transitioning into another species. So we need to go to the Bible, which is, as you know, is absolute truth. And the reason why we need to go to the Bible is it is because it is truth. And, and we can go to the Bible to explore that question. When did dinosaurs live? And how old are they? Well, the big question is, do we even see the word dinosaur in the word of God? Most of all, if not all, will say, no, I don't see the word dinosaur in the Bible. But we do see the word dinosaur in the Bible. We don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible, but we do find dinosaurs. What we need to do is to take God's word to examine history and to examine what is going on currently. The Bible gives us the history of God's creation in Genesis 1 and 2. We see the origin of the heavens and the earth. We see the origin of plant life and the animal kingdom. And we also see the history of mankind. So really in the book of Genesis, we see the origin of everything seen and unseen. Dinosaurs existed and they roamed this earth. So therefore, according to God's holy word, God created the dinosaurs when he created the animal kingdom on the sixth day of creation. Dinosaurs are a part of the animal kingdom. So let's establish something that is vital. We must understand and believe that the Holy Bible is God's absolute truth and absolute authority on everything. His word is perfect and powerful. It's able to instruct, correct, and rebuke. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Psalms 33.4 says, The word of the Lord is right, and all his works is done in truth. Psalms 119, 160 says, the entirety of your word is truth. In Proverbs 35, every word of God is true. So these are just, you know, just a few of many verses in the Bible that states that God's word is truth. There is no lie or deception in his word. Some people, even though they claim to be Christians, will pick and choose through the Bible what they will believe. Many have their own interpretations concerning scripture. Well, the Bible is plain. In 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So here we learn real quick that we need to lean on God's understanding and not our own. As Christians, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. So let's first and foremost establish in our hearts that scripture gives us an accurate understanding of all things that took place in history, even way, way back 6,000 years to the beginning of creation. We take that understanding of what took place in the past and then what we do is we apply it to the evidence of the present. And then, of course, we line it all up with scripture. And what you will find your conclusion to be is that when studying real science confirms what the Bible says. There's no controversy or confusion. And we know that God is a God of order. You will be amazed at how real science lines up with God's word. <clears throat> there are all kinds of controversies swirling around out there over where dinosaurs came from and when they roamed the earth. There's controversy over the age of the earth, the age of the universe, how matter came to be, how life came to be. There's controversy over how even man came to be. There's controversy over when the dinosaurs roamed the earth and what happened to them that caused them to go extinct. Well, it all boils down to only two interpretations. 
we have man's interpretation, and then we have God's word. We have the secular world view, and then we have God's view. Which one of these views or these interpretations are correct? Only one can be correct. Both cannot be correct at the same time, and both can't be an error at the same time. One is the truth. There are two kinds of scientists. You have secular scientists, and then you have scientists that are creationists. These scientists are composed of archaeologists, astronomers, geologists, geophysicists, microbiologists, and I imagine I missed a few, um, but all of them, both secular and creationists, what they do is they examine the exact same stuff on this earth. They both dig through the same dirt. It's not like there's stuff for scientists who are creationists and then there's stuff for secular scientists. What I want you to understand, and this is what they have in common, is that they all do research on the same stuff. They do research and they examine the same galaxies, the same planets, starlight in the universe. They do research and they examine the same bones and fossils, the same DNA. They dig through the same layers of dirt in this present time. So where the scientists who are secular and the scientists who are creationists how they are different is how they interpret what they have found and researched. Secular scientists have multiple theories about where these fossils or those fossils came from or how old they are or on and on. So how do they make those assumptions and come up with their theories? Well, how they come up with their, how they make those assumptions and come up with those theories is on what took place in the past. If their assumptions are in error, then their conclusions will also be flawed as well. Secular scientists have come up with some conclusions concerning the dinosaurs that are, that is false. Their conclusions are flawed because their assumptions are flawed. When it concerns history, secular science will choose man's word over God's word every single time, and they will not compromise. They're absolutely not going to sway off the course. Up until the last 1700s to the early 1800s, the majority of the scientists believed in the Holy Bible. So what was discovered in that time frame that changed how secular science scientists come up with their assumptions. What did they discover that caused them to reject the Bible and throw Genesis out the window? Well, you will be surprised to find that they found nothing of value. According to Answers in Genesis, this is a report that they made that people like James Hutton and Charles Lyell and other scientists of this same secular mindset who came on the scene and they suggested this, that, well, we don't need the biblical account of creation and Noah's flood to explain these fossils or these bones and rock layers. We can explain all of these things that we are digging, digging up through natural processes. With natural processes, we can make sense of what we are finding. We just have to make sure we inject into our assumptions enough time, like adding millions and millions of years. This came about not because they had it new evidence to base this new and improved explanation upon, they had nothing. 
they had absolutely nothing of value. Again, these secular scientists are digging up and doing research on the same fossils, the same bones, the same rock layers, the same DNA. Again, the difference was the secular scientists' interpretation, and then we have the interpretation of the scientist who is a creationist. What is so sad is if you open up any textbook or informational material about dinosaurs, whether whether it is for adults or children. Look at the documentaries that's out there and the books and the pamphlets, anything that has anything to do with dinosaurs. How do they start off talking to people, informing people about dinosaurs? Is that they will say, well, millions and millions of years ago. People hear the same lie over and over. And after a while, if you hear a lie enough times, you will believe that it is fact. After a while, you won't even question this fact. It becomes reality. So now we have our kids graduating from school and college, knowing all about the Big Bang, the age of the earth being four to five billion years old, the Neanderthal and other ape men, evolution, dinosaurs that lived over 65 million years ago. They've been taught this from when they were little toddlers, preschool children, all the way up to the highest schooling that they go. So how many times, let me ask you this question, how many times in the public school and in Colleges, just think about the schools that you went to in the colleges. How many times was the creation account brought out to show a comparison to the class, to the evolution theory? I don't ever remember it happening once. I believe it's, it's zero or close to zero, especially if it's a public institution. Maybe Christian schools and colleges do show a comparison but I do know the public schools do not. You know, so look at the plan of Satan to take our children captive. What Satan will do is he will use the dinosaurs to build a foundation in our children's lives to accept the secular evolution worldview. There are children's view videos out there and you will be very familiar with them that lay this evolution foundation. We have all these cute videos uh, such as the land before time, the great dinosaur rescue, ice age, Sesame Street, and on and on. Kids learn early on that the Bible has no relevance in our modern scientific age. If they cannot believe in God's word and what God says in Bible history, well then how can we believe in the salvation message? If we reject the creation account in Genesis, then how can we accept the new creation account in, in the Gospels? And if we reject the creation account in Genesis, how can we accept the recreation account in the book of Revelation? The creation account, the record of the fall, sin, Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, man needing a savior, the new creation account in the Gospels where God sent a remedy. He sent his son to redeem us from sin and the curse of the law. And then we have the recreation account when God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Sin, death, and hell are done away with forever. And this is the full picture of God's God's full or complete redemptive work for mankind. Genesis 1 through 11, these 11 chapters are extremely important in our faith as Christians because it's our basic foundation of our faith. If the creation account is rejected, then there is really no basic foundation upon which our faith can be built. If a person cannot trust the beginning of the Bible, then how can that person 
trust what is written in the rest of the Bible, even to the end. You know, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, and he said, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and yet you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? You know, we must defend the faith. And that's what I am doing today. I am defending our faith. We are exhorted in the Bible to defend the faith. In 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense or give an explanation to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with humbleness. So what we, we need to do is we need to open up our Bibles to Genesis 1 and read where God created the dinosaurs. And let's go to Genesis 1. Let's start in verse 24. And God said, let the land produce li living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. So God created the animal kingdom, which includes the dinosaurs on the morning of the sixth day. Man was created on the sixth day as well, but that afternoon. Does God tell us when he specifically created dinosaurs? Well, no, he does not. We have, to, we have to remember that the Bible is not a science textbook. It does not give us all the specifics of geology and biology and the physics and so forth. But let's think about this through the lens of the Bible. Dinosaurs were land animals. So the Bible says land animals were made on day six. So why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Well, we also don't find words like automobile, airplanes, rockets, trains, or computer. The word dinosaur was not invented until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. And dinosaur means terrible lizard. The word dinosaur was not even used on a regular basis until the early 1900s. There is a word in the Bible that does describe dinosaurs, and that word is dragon or levithan. The word dragon is mentioned numerous times in the Bible. Here's an example in Psalm 174, 14. You broke the heads of, of the levithan in pieces and gave them as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. So dinosaur, <clears throat> of course, this dinosaur was in the water. This dinosaur could be pertaining to the, the Chronosaurus or the Plesiosaur, which were very large aquatic creatures. It says in Job 41 that the Levithon cannot be restrained or tamed. It is frightening to look at, and it's best to leave it alone. In verse 12, it says that it has a graceful form, and it's, inc it's incredibly well protected with scales. It has fearsome teeth, and death awaits anyone who approaches, it, approaches its mouth. It cannot be caged because it will break iron like straw. Smoke pours from its nostrils, and fire bands stream from its mouth. So here we see a fire-breathing dragon. And if you want to read more about this creature, you can, because it's in Job 41. In the book of Job, it looks like God himself is describing a dinosaur. And Job 40, verse 15, here's another word for dinosaur. Look at the Behemoth. Behemoth is another word for dinosaur. Look at the behemoth. That's what God is showing all of us today in Job 40, 15. Look at this dinosaur. Look at behemoth, which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. It's... <coughs> 
Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are close knit. <coughs> its bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like rods of iron. Well, it just looks like Job, or, or God wanted Job to behold the behemoth. Then it was not a mystical creature, was it? It's not some kind of a legend. It was a real creature. Now, some Bible definitions of the behemoth is described as a hippopotamus or an elephant. When we read about the description of a behemoth in the book of Job, it certainly does line up with an elephant or a hippo. Why? Because it eats grass. Its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. And if you look at an elephant and you look at a hippopotamus, they do have big bellies. So it does, a behemoth does line up with a hippo or an elephant and they both eat grass. Well, if you look at a dinosaur, a dinosaur also has a big belly and many dinosaurs ate grass. But when it says the behemoth's tail, look at the tail. When it says his tail sways like a cedar, the cedars of Lebanon were huge trees. If you look at the tails of a hippopotamus or an elephant, they are small, skinny tails. They certainly don't have tails like that of a cedar. So there are such things as uh, fire burning critters on this earth right now. God created a fire burning critter and we know this critter as a bombardier beetle. A bombardier beetle is a beetle that injects hot, almost at to the boiling point hot, a noxious chemical and it sprays this chemical from its abdomen and it comes out with such heat and force that there's a popping sound. The damage that it inflicts on other insects, of course, can be fatal. So if this little, <clears throat> little one inch beetle can do this, what can God do with a dragon? If dinosaurs lived at the same time as man, what did they eat? Well, before the fall, Dinosaurs, as well as all of the animal kingdom, as we know from Genesis, they ate vegetation. How do we know this? This Genesis 129 tells us this. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heaven, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given you every green plant for food, and it was so. So, as we can see before the fall, animals were not killing other animals and eating them. So remember, before the fall, there was absolutely no death, no suffering, no pain. There was no animals killing each other. There was Man was not killing animals and eating them. There absolutely was no killing and there was no death until after man sinned. So we know that even the T-Rex was a vegetarian. So what happened on this earth that changed everything? Something had to have happened. What was that? Do you have a guess? Sin. Sin brought death, suffering, disease, sickness, killing into this world. This is part of the curse. Romans 8.22 says, says, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with faith, birth pangs and together until now. So because of sin, everything was affected on this earth, the animal kingdom, the plant life, the whole universe. That includes all the galaxies, all the planets that are out there. Sin was huge. Adam has no, I don't think he had any comprehension of how massive of, a, of, of what he did when he sinned. 
it, it was just tremendous that it affect, affected everything in the whole universe. So what happens when, <clears throat> so let's go back to the secular scientists. So what happens when secular scientists inject millions and millions and millions and millions of years into the creation account of Genesis? Well, it makes no difference if it's theistic evolution theory or the gap theory or the secular evolution theory, no matter what, all of these theories have one major flaw. And what I mean by evolution, theistic evolution theory is that there are Christians who believe that this earth is millions of years old, that dinosaurs lived before man was created, that somehow there, there was some kind of something before Adam and Eve was created. And that death was a part of, of that world before Adam and Eve was created. And then you have the gap theory, which is the same thing. They believe that there was something that happened before Adam and Eve was created. And then you have the secular evolution theory. So all of these theories, what happens is that it puts death before sin. Every single one of those theories is flawed in that way. Suppose dinosaurs and other creatures actually did live millions of years on this earth before Adam and Eve was created. Let's just pretend that that's really how it happened. Well, this would mean that death was here before sin and under all those layers would be bones and fossils of creatures who have died. They lived and then they died. It means God would have planted the Garden of Eden on a top of layers and layers of bones and fossils. <clears throat> we find dinosaurs and other creatures buried in layers, and we find some of these creatures were meat eaters. So some of those dinosaurs were meat eaters. We find evidence of diseases in bones of these animals. There were, there's even um, animals that are being dug up, dinosaurs that have brain tumors, cancer, deformities, arthritis, and not only dinosaurs that they've dug up, but other animals as well. What I want to point out is that none of those conditions ever, cre ever existed before the fall. There's no evidence in scripture that any of the animals were predators before the fall. God brought the animals to Adam and he named them. And Adam was not afraid of any of them. Not one of those animals tried to attack and eat Adam. Dinosaur bones and fossils of a multitude of creatures were buried after the fall of man. God never would have called millions of years of death, disease, decay, and killing as very good. If millions of years are squeezed into the Bible and there's death before sin, then death is not, a, not the consequence or the payment for sin. If death is not the payment for sin, then Christ's death on the cross was null and void. Christ's death does not pay for our sin debt. If Christ's death does not pay for our sin debt, debt then we are all lost in our sins. So many people who claim to be Christians do not believe in the literal biblical account of Genesis. It's hard for their natural mind to comprehend God creating the world and all that is in it, the universe, Adam and Eve, in six 24-hour days. They believe dinosaurs existed millions of years before man was created. They just died off and eventually became extinct, and then God made Adam and Eve. After the flood, God said to Noah, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Since the flood, we can have steak and fried chicken with our fruits and our vegetables. God put the fear of man into the beasts. 
And this is why you have animals are afraid of man. They will run away from you. In the original creation, Adam, animals were not afraid of man. And every animal ate plants. And this will take place again during the millennial reign of Christ. When Jesus returns after the great tribulation period, he will usher in in a paradise that was just like the Garden of Eden. The nature of the animals will change. It says in Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, the wolf also will dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So you can see we're going to go back. You know, when Jesus Christ returns, we're going to have a world that's like the Garden of Eden. Everything's going to go back to God's original plan. But the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned, the fall changed everything. It changed the animal kingdom. It changed the plant kingdom. It changed the entire universe and all became cursed. That's why this universe is dying. That's why this earth is dying. Because this age is going to pass away. Some dinosaurs became meat eaters and ferocious creatures after the fall. But this was not God's original plan. There, there, you know, look at the, the vegetation. There was thorns and thistles formed. Weeds sprung up in the garden. How many times do you have to wear garden gloves, gloves to pull weeds? And even with garden gloves, I end up, you know, pulling these little jiggers out of my hand. We have fruit trees, but they're, you know, you, you, you will find um, farmers in their, in their orchards, you know, always treating their trees, their fruit trees because of blight and disease. Worms and beetles will get into the trees or get into the fruit. And I do remember my dad treating our plum trees with a medicinal sap because some kind of blight or some kind of insect was causing his trees to get sick. So did all the dinosaurs die in the flood? That's another question. Did all the dinosaurs die in the flood of Noah? A lot of people think this. You know, they're, they're thinking that when all the animals got on the ark, the, <laughs> those dinosaurs were not allowed on. You know, Noah somehow banned the dinosaurs from entering the ark. Well, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible say something different? Oh, but all the dinosaurs died. Or is that man's assumption? Maybe that's man's assumption. Let's go to the Bible and find out. Let's look at Genesis 7, 15. God said, pairs of all, A-L-L, -L, pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. It does not say most of the creatures or the majority of the creatures or, or all of the creatures except dinosaurs. It does not say that. And I know what you're thinking. How is it possible for Noah to fit dinosaurs on the ark? After all, they're very huge. Well, when you visit the replica of the ark in Kentucky, I guarantee that you will be overwhelmed at the sheer size of this ark. I mean, it is huge. I was totally shocked at how massive this ark was. I stood outside the ark and just marveled before I could even go in. And then when I went inside, it was just as massive in the inside. It's 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, and 51 feet high. 
and it has three levels. It has the capacity, the capacity equals 500 railroad stock cars. But you might say, well, you know, there's a lot of animals. How did Noah do it? Well, he took only land-dwelling animals, air-breathing animals. There were no fish. Noah took two of each kind, not a variety. For example, he took one kind of dog and a variety. You know, he didn't take on the ark a whole variety of dogs. Today we have 400 varieties of dogs and 400 varieties of cats, maybe even more than that. But Noah only took one variety of dog, one variety of cat, and so forth. He took one basic kind of dinosaur, one basic kind of horse, one basic kind of cattle, and on and on. The only, he did take seven pair of clean animals, but we're talking here about the other kind of animals. So there were only about 60 to 80 dinosaur kinds during, well, during the time when God created the dinosaurs. The average size dinosaur is equal that to that of a bison. Some dinosaurs were as small as chickens. All dinosaurs started out small. All dinosaurs when, you know, were hatched from eggs. So all dinosaurs, when they hatched out of their eggs, were about the size of a football. God brought all young animals to the ark, young adult animals. Dinosaurs that were young would have been smaller when they entered into the ark. Same with elephants and hippos. They would have been young animals, uh, maybe pre-adult size, and so they would be smaller. The maximum number of kinds of animals Noah would need taking for account of all the, ver the variation that we see today, this would have been 1,400 kinds. Once all the animals were on the ark, the maximum total would have roughly been 6,785 animals. It says in Genesis 7:11 that on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and it rained 40 days and 40 nights and catastrophic events would have taken place on this earth. I mean, there would have been earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, massive land upheavals, mountains rising up out of the waters. We see, you know, all these plates under the, earth colliding together and there would have been the Alps would have been formed the Rocky Mountains the Andes it would have been great shifts of land the whole world during the flood of Noah would have heaved and the earth would have been in great turmoil and and these great catastrophic events that occurred on this earth would have been incomprehensible the earth was bit the earth, yeah. The ark was built in such a way where it was able to ride through that terrible upheaval and not break apart or sink. It must have rocked and rolled for 40 days and 40 nights, something awful. There might have been waves crashing over the top of that ark, huge tsunamis, land masses crashing into other land masses and causing huge, gigantic waves. You know, everything that had breath, man and beast would have died in that flood. Nothing survived except those who were on the ark. And this is why we find billions and billions of dead things buried in rock layers that were laid down by water all over this earth. The flood took place around 4,300 years ago. That really is that not that long ago when you think about it. There is forensic evidence of dinosaurs existing in the not too distant past. Archaeologists have actually found soft tissue in the bones of dinosaurs. 
They have found blood vessels that remain soft and spongy. They found red blood cells were found in an unfossilized portion of a T-Rex bone. There are 14 biomaterials bio found in dinosaur bones and horns that revealed that they died out thousands of years ago, not millions. These are the kind of findings that blows a fuse in the brain of secular scientists. They are in a quandary over these findings of soft tissue, fish, soft tissue and red blood cells. The soft tissue and red blood cells have been tested over and over and over to make sure that this organic material is not something else that they found. It was always conclusive that it indeed is soft tissue and blood cells of a dinosaur. And this caused a real big headache for the secular scientist because they are not going to compromise and sway off the worldview. So how do they explain this? How do they take these findings and somehow explain them in order to fit them into the evolutionary mindset? Well, there was a documentary on the Discovery Channel where one of these individuals was interviewed that did extensive research on this soft tissue. And she is a paleontologist named Mary Schweitzers. She is a secular scientist. She said these findings were incredible. And after extensive testing, it proved the soft tissue and the blood vessels were indeed from a dinosaur. She claimed that there is some kind of biological process going on that we don't know about. So we have to now rethink the whole chemical process where bone turns into a fossil. But notice what she did not say. She did not say, well, we have to rethink the age of the dinosaur. Maybe they didn't live on this earth millions and millions of years ago. Maybe they actually are not all that old. Secular scientists, like I said, they're not going to compromise. They're not going to give up their conclusion that dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. She'd never say, well, it just seems like dinosaurs, you know, just didn't. You know, seems like dinosaurs existed not so long ago. But instead she says, well, there's just some kind of biological chemical process occurring that we have never observed. And that chemical process has caused that soft tissue to last over 65 million years. Well, it's impossible for soft tissue to last even 1 million years much less 65 million years. It's too fragile. Dinosaurs were on the ark, and when the ark landed on Mount Ararat, they got off the ark and lived with man on this earth after the flood. So the question here is, is there actual historical documentation of dinosaurs living with mankind after the flood? But we have to remember that dinosaur is a recent word. Long ago, dinosaurs were actually called dragons, and they were called dragons all around the world. There's historical accounts all over the world in every region, every nation, every culture about dinosaurs. Secular evolutionists, many won't admit it, but if they're honest, they certainly know about these writings. There was the writing of St. George who killed a dragon around 295 AD. This slaying actually took place in Libya. From the description of the dinosaur that he killed, it most likely was a baryonyx. And in that very region, bones of the baryonyx dinosaurs can be found. The city of Nerluc, France, was named in honor of the dragon that was killed there. It was described as being bigger than an ox with a sharp 
long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years around 1271 AD, and he reported that the emperor raised dragons to pull his chariots in the parades. There is ancient artwork all over the world showing pictures or carvings of dinosaurs. You can do your own research and see for yourself the artwork of ancient times actually showing dinosaurs. So what eventually happened to the dinosaurs? We do not see any dinosaurs roaming on the earth today, do we? Well, they died off. They became extinct. Actually, there are 881 animal species that have gone extinct since 1500. Evolutionists will try and convince us that birds are dinosaurs, that dinosaurs evolved into birds. So they're saying, well, when you see birds, you're seeing dinosaurs. Well, that's not true. It's biologically and genetically impossible. There is a theory that a huge meteorite smashed into the earth and killed the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. So what we're finding as we study the word of God that that's not true. Why did dinosaurs finally become extinct after the flood? Well, probably because of climate change. How do you like that word? We're hearing that a lot today. But you know what? Climate change is coming because when Jesus Christ sets up his millennial reign, there's going to be a whole new climate change. And certainly the climate is going to change during the great tribulation period. But that's what happened way back after Noah's flood, climate change. We had the ice age, the flood destroyed the people, the animals, and actually the flood destroyed the earth as well. Like I said, there was this huge drastic climate change after the flood and food sources did become scarce. An ice age occurred after the flood and this would have caused, again, climate change. The earth was more hostile. It was much colder. It was either much too, too cold or it was too hot. There was no even temperate climate that they had before the flood. Remember, there was this watery dome over the earth that kept the whole earth at a temperate uh, it kept the whole earth temperate. So they no longer had this even temperate climate. So here you had cold spells, hot spells, dry spells, wet spells, harsh weather patterns, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, snowstorms, windstorms. This would have disrupted the entire animal kingdom. So remember before the flood, this watery dome that surrounded the whole world kept dangerous radiation from the sun from hitting the earth. Radiation causes cancer and mutations that will shorten the life of every creature. Before the flood, people lived centuries, not decades, centuries. Adam lived 930 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. The average age for a man before the flood was 912 years. Today, the average age for a man is 75 to 80. So here we see a big difference. After the flood, people probably hunted dinosaurs down. God said in Genesis 9, 2, that after the flood, fear and dread would fall upon the beasts of the earth. Animals were now afraid of man, so they'd either run from them or attack them. Many animals have gone extinct because man was killing them off. We almost lost the buffalo in the Midwest due to extinction in the mid eight, in the 1800s. So what we're coming down to is that we can trust God's word to answer all the questions that you may have concerning the origin of all things. Genesis has the answers. God has all the answers in his written word. So in summary, the Bible timeline places dinosaurs at the very beginning of creation 6,000 years ago. I hope that this answered your questions on dinosaurs. I will be answering more questions later as we continue in our series in the book of Genesis. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for 
shown us in your word, these, these questions that we may have about your creation. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to bless our hearts and to lead us into your word to have all of our answers answered. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.